So today our title is uh, Lord help me have the right perspective on money. You know I've talked about having the right perspective before. So we want to have the right perspective on money because money is so such an important uh, thing. And I want to start with a quote. Wealth is a path to idolatry and poverty is a symptom of a fallen society. Just a thought this morning. Wealth is a path to idolatry and poverty is a symptom of a fallen society. Just something to make you think about what is wealth? What does it mean to me? How important is it uh, in my life? In every generation and in all nations, we have to deal with the issues of wealth and poverty. It's everywhere in every country. Of course, not at the same level, but it is. And having the right perspective on money will help Christians to live with God's objectives in mind. So this morning we are going to start a series. And, I, and it's not about... Uh, telling you you must give this and you must support that. That's not, as you will see this morning, that's not what we're talking about. But money is such an important uh, issue in our lives. How, we are, how we, do we see it? How do we pursue it? How do we spend it? I have a friend who is um, uh, an accountant and he told me, just show me anybody's uh, accounting, the, the spending lifestyle, and I will tell you about who that person is. Just, just show me the accounts and I will know what this organization is about, what this person is about, where the money is earned from and where it is spent. So a few weeks ago I spoke on living without regret and how you and I view and use money will have a lot to do about living a life without regret or with some regret. There have been a variety of Christian views on poverty and wealth. Uh, Mr. Cobb, a theologian, wrote, Western society is organized in the service of wealth, and thus wealth has triumphed over God and the West. And that's something, do you agree with this? Western society is organized, it's all about the service of wealth, the economy among the nations, it's all about, you know, economy and wealth. So wealth has triumphed over God and the West, and the Western countries or atmosphere, hallelujah. At uh, the part, PowerPoint number two, we have a spectrum here and different uh, worldview, a, a view which looks at wealth and materialism. One is evil. You look at money is evil. This is one view to look at it. And the other one is like wealth is the will of God. Everybody should be rich. Okay. So these are the two extremes. And in between, you know, we are somewhere in between of that or that uh, spectrum. And uh, uh, Professor David Miller uh, presents three dominant attitudes among the Protestant church or since the reformations toward wealth. Number one is uh, wealth is an offense to faith. This is in, in the early Christianity. We, we looked at wealth and it's more holy to be poor. Wealth is evil. A rich person is, is evil. Um, number two, wealth is an obstacle to faith. Uh, according to Dr. David Miller, Martin Luther viewed mammon, or the desire for wealth, as the most common idol on earth. And Miller mentioned Jesus when he met with the rich ruler in Mark chapter 10, as an example of wealth being an obstacle to, 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 to faith, because the young ruler chose his possessions and did not choose to follow Jesus Christ. So in that context, uh, wealth is an obstacle uh, to faith. Also, Mr. Miller continuing and, and quoting Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. So that's again the love of money. Those who seek to uh, get rich will find many, many traps and foolish and harmful desire. And then the same thought of verse 10 says, the love of money is the root 
of all evil. And we need to understand this clearly. It's not money. It's the love of money we're talking about. Money is nothing. It's just like piece of paper or something. It just has a value, abstract value. And the third uh, one is wealth as an outcome of fate. That's a completely different one. And uh, the ancient Protestant view the pursuit of wealth not only as acceptable, but as a religious uh, duty. Why? B why we can see that? Because in the Puritan theology uh, views, hard work and frugal lifestyle is a spiritual way of life. This is the values that we have grown up with, most of us. I remember me, this is what uh, has been conveyed to me. In your life, you're supposed to work hard. And if you work hard, then you will be saving some money, and then your life will, will be improving. So that is something like this. And also with a frugal lifestyle, not spending for selfish or self-gratification. It's like, I remember when I was very young, I had an uncle who was a hockey player, and he came to our village to play, like his, his village had a, a team, and the, the team of his village came to, to play against my village team. And he was the youngest uncle, and he was cool, and he was, you know, good in hockey, so I really like him. So after the game, we went to our small village. We only had one restaurant with pool, pool table and slot machines and all this. That was the only place like that in the village. We went there, and I went to my, um, my cool uncle to borrow five cents because I wanted to play to the slot machines. And you know what he told me? He just coded me and rebuked me so much for having this thought of spending five cents and wasting money in the wrong place and everything. And he, I was all humiliated, red in the face. And I was, you know, like, because I thought, that, no, he's a cool uncle. He will give me five cents and then I can play the machine. And then I said, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> you should not spend five minutes on, on this one. So it's, it's part of one concept of, of, of money. You should work hard, earn your money, and don't waste the money on, on, the, on the wrong place. I live frugal, get a budget, don't spend anything, just like uh, all this. And John Wesley was a strong proponent of wealth creation. Uh, but he also understood something more about w gathering wealth. So this is how he exhorted his listeners. Earn all that you can. Save all that you can and give away all that you can. So that's a better, better way. Earn everything you can, save everything you can, and give away everything you can. Amen? Hallelujah. So, and then that group also would include like all the prosperity theology preachers, which maybe is an extreme, but this is going uh, in that category. So these are three of the main views about money. Money is evil. Money may present some obstacle to our faith. Or money is an outcome of faith. You have faith, you will prosper. God will bless you. You, you are living a good life. I remember another uh, thing, like uh, when I became a Christian, I work in a chocolate factory in my, my town. And, uh, you know, people w w wanted to get to, to know me. So one of the workers one day asked me, so where do you, what bar do you go to on the weekend? And I says, uh, I don't go to bar, because I, I, I just got saved, you know, from that, so I was not going to bar. Oh, you're one of those who watch TV at home, and said, and at that time, I didn't have a TV, and I didn't watch TV. <laughs> so I said, no, I don't watch TV. <laughs> what do you do then? You don't go to bar, you don't watch TV. Like, what is this? I says, I go to church. And then he got so angry, and there was a, a wood pallet on the floor. You take it and threw it again and started to, to, to swear about it. And, I, and then you give all of your money to these preachers and to these churches, and you get all the money to them. And, I, and then I remember telling him, you know, before I was in bar, I was spending money on cigarettes, alcohol, wine, beer, and all sorts of things. Like I was spending money in the wrong place, destroying my life. Now I'm saving money instead. You know, I'm using money for something that is good. I, I, I remember uh, having this conversation with them. Amen. Amen. So the best way for all of us to have a biblical view of wealth and poverty is to look at scriptures. But you will find that many times it seems that looking at the Old Testament, there's a, a duality 
and, and how money is presented. Because it's very clear that God says money is a good thing. Abraham was rich, Solomon was rich, Solomon has, you know, told the Lord, I just want to be a good leader. He says, okay, you didn't ask for money, you didn't ask for a long life, we'll give you a lot of money, you will be the richest, the wisest, you know, and everything. So money is not bad at all in the Old Testament. But money comes with very strict and severe warning as well. So you have this duality, money is good, but money is dangerous. You can, you can find it. And God presents to us many, many things in the Bible. Proverb 10. We go to the next slide. Proverb 10. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth or makes rich, depending on which Bible version you're looking at. But we want to look at the, this expression, brings wealth or makes rich. And we often think that wealth is, is money. Wealth is you know, something in your wallet or in your bank account. But here it's, it's more than that. If you look at the, uh, the Hebrew word, it's like accumulate. That's the word. It could be just the word accumulate. It accumulates. The blessing of the Lord accumulates or makes rich or grow or make self. It builds up. It builds up a house. Like the Bible says, the wise woman builds up a house. The foolish one destroys it with her own hands. So the, the, the blessing of the Lord builds up your life. It builds you up. It brings you higher. It, it does something positive into you. So that's the idea of that. And in Proverbs, it also brings a very good, simple work ethics. And uh, in the next point, 10.4. A slack hand cause poverty but the hand of the diligent makes rich so working is part of God's God's plan of course the Old Testament is not without warnings about wealth we have to be careful to remember what is the source of our wealth be, be, being being Christian Deuteronomy 8 18 you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you power to get wealth and again, wealth here means resources, strength, army, and mighty riches. So here the word wealth has a different, uh, different. It, it's like a lot of resources, means, strength. Like an army, you have uh, many soldiers and your army is like for a king. Uh, the, 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 it is the Lord who makes you strong and makes you mighty. And we are warned not to put our trust or to depend upon the, the, the wealth. The psalmist describes in Psalm 52 verse 7, the man who did not, look here is a young man who refuses to make God his strength. Instead, he trusted in his great wealth and made his wickedness his strength. So the, 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 his, his wealth turned his mind away from the Lord and then uh, some wicked plans he accumulated more strength, more power, more authority, uh, more ability to, to abuse some, someone else. Further, the possession of wealth comes with the obligation to care for the needy. Proverb 19:17: he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. So two important principles about wealth this morning. Number one, wealth is a blessing only if it is used in the way God intended. So blessing is great things. Riches are great things. Money is a great things. To, to prosper, to become stronger, a more influential person in society is a great things. Only if it is going in the right directions that God intended for us. The second one is above all else, God is concerned with our attitudes. And many times the way that we use money will always reflect our attitude. This is about attitudes. So let's go, let's look in, in Genesis what happened. Is God against money? Is God like wants us to be poor? Not at all, because in the, in the beginning, God created the material world and walk with man in perfect fellowship. So this material world cannot be evil since God created it uh, and walked in it and says that it was good. But Something changed everything, and you know what it is, the fall. The fall changed everything. Before the fall, 
there was no poverty, there was no inequality, there was no injustice, and all of these things were in existence. There was no sinfulness uh, spread among human beings. But the fall changed everything. After the fall, poverty can be seen, and the increased difficulty of the work itself. You will work with sweats, you will work and the, the earth will be cursed and you will not earn all the fullness of the potential of this ground. You will work hard for the rest of their life and you will return to dust, you know, and everything. So from the fall, you know, poverty and working hard and toiling and laboring has, has, has come. And it has also opened the door for people to accumulate wealth as work techniques develop, as, you know, human beings, we are created in the image of God. So when there is a difficulty in tilting the ground, human being invented a machine or an instrument to make it easier. And by inventing and ameliorating our conditions of work and the tools of work, then we, human being started to prosper and become richer and more you know, powerful in certain areas and others. And then the divisions between poverty and riches started very early from uh, the fall of man. The fall changed everything. And that's why in the Old Testament, the condition of the poor is one of the issues that matter most to God, okay? And his law have provided a lot of good things to protect the poor, to help them, and the, the law has a lot of economic uh, protection in it. And uh, the more I was studying this uh, topic uh, this week, the more I realized we are going so much far away from these laws of economics that God has made for the protection of society and protection of the poor. We are walking so, so away from, from that. The first point, uh, protection from creditors, one of the law here. Creditors could not charge interest or keep garments. If uh, someone was poor and um, you could not keep, uh, you have to give it back, the blanket at night, you know. You could not take the tools of a man's trade as security for a loan. If, if uh, uh, a carpenter, for instance, would borrow money from you, you could not take his carpentry tools away from him to, to protect yourself, to make sure, because this is how he earns money. God, God provided these law. I, Exodus, I think you can read it over there. And Deuteronomy 24 says the same thing. When you make a neighbor a loan of any sorts and he is a poor man, you restore to him the pledge as the sun sets. If it is his coat, you give him back his coat because, or his blanket because this is what he will keep warm. And uh, notice that in s these scriptures, there's always uh, uh, something like, I put it in bold over here. And this is very important for us because we want to understand wealth and the view of God. This is his only covering, his cloak for his body. And what shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. So God cares for this poor worker. Okay, and he will see it. So he calls to society, says you better treat that person properly. And here it says, if you give him the pledge as the sun sets so that he will be able to sleep in his cloth, and this man will be happy to have something to keep himself warm, and then he will bless you, and it shall be righteousness for you before the Lord your God. So when you do an act of goodness to the poor people, you live rightly, this is righteousness. You know, sometimes we, we, we have difficulty to understand righteousness, justice. What is living in righteousness? This is a pure example here. We want to know how should I live in righteousness? How can I practice a way of righteousness? Here, it shall be righteousness to you, the way that you treat the needy, the, those who are hungry, those who need. You, you cannot abuse them. They, they are being protected uh, by, by the Lord. Amen? The second point, the workers have a right to timely wage, I think. Eh? The next point, yeah. Workers were protected by biblical commands. They were to be paid on time and not cheated. The poor worker was to receive 
his wage on the day of his labor so that he could eat, that he could bring food and his uh, family. And again in verse 15 here, says you have to give him his wage on the same day before the sun set for he is poor and he counts on it lest he cry against you to the Lord and you will be guilty of sin. So these are deep root in our views of wealth and how we use money, salaries in our society and this is very important to the eyes of God because God says if you don't act like this in society you will be guilty of sin before the Lord. And we, we forget. You know, we, we read the Old Testament. We, we just go through these texts. And we forget that these simple rules are what marks our society or should, should mark our society. Workers, employers. This is how we are supposed to treat people in life. And we, so, so when we read the Old Testament, don't, don't go too fast because these are the rules of God for our society. And we will see much more of that. Gleaning and harvest. The, the, the next point on that one. The corners of fields and the grapes dropped by the workers were reserved for the poor. When you reap your harvest, when you beat your olive trees, when you gather the grapes, don't go back to pick up. Don't, don't go for a second g trying to not to leave anything. And, uh, you know, I've done cherry picking before uh, in, the, in the Rocky Mountains with my wife. And then we, it was like a big job, like you're climbing in the stairs on the trees and then you're trying to pick. Tree. And sometimes to us, we finish that tree. And then the employer comes and says, no, you left too many. Go back. Go back there. You left too many. A cherry is not acceptable in all of this. But here God says, you will leave these things there because the poor people were going over there to, to try. And then again, it says in the text here, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Wow, how many of us wants to be blessed in all the works of our hands? Everything we do is blessed by the Lord. A simple rule of society here in Deuteronomy chapter 24, if you look at this, at this text. So you, you take care of the, here, the sojourner, which is the foreigners. How many are foreigners here? Foreigners, fatherless, and wi widow, okay? You take care of them that the Lord your God may bless you and all the work of your hands. Next slide. We continue with another series of rules that God has given us. The Sabbath years. You know the Sabbath is a very wonderful protection. The day of the Sabbath is a day of rest. Every week the workers cannot work seven days a week. Even the donkey cannot work seven days a week. You need, you need to rest. And we have broken all these rules of God in society. It's incredible how we broke all of these. The, they spoke to wealth and poverty. There is the Sabbath day, but there is also the Sabbath year. The Sabbath year is really, uh, really important. Besides rest, the rest of the land, not only the rest of the worker, but there is a rest of the land. And if you know your Bible well, the captivity, the, the, the fall of Israel and Judah and their captivity to Babylon is due, largely mentioned clearly many, many times and repeated because they broke the Sabbath years the law. They didn't leave the land of God, the promised land and rest. And they abused it because of their greed and they didn't trust the Lord. Because in the law of the Sabbath years goes like this. You, and I remember when I was young, we practiced this in, in our place. My, my grandfather, my uncles, we would till the land and we would see the line. But every uh, I, don't, I don't remember the, 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 how it worked in terms of numbers, but I remember there were always fields left untilted and un, un, uncultivated. They had to rest. It, that, that, that was part of how I, I grew up. This is my grandfather practices, my uncles practices. Some piece of land were not to be cultivated. They had to rest. They had to strengthen themselves instead of always pouring out, you know, fertilizers and making them to produce and to making. So some part of the lands were to be left at rest. So this is very, very important. 
but God was teaching also a lesson of trust because he says if you if you read the, the, the text in Leviticus the seventh year there shall be a, a Sabbath of solemn rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you. So even though you are not sowing in it, it will still produce from the leftover seed from you know, the, the previous harvest. Something comes out from the ground. Don't worry, God says, you, it will produce something for you and for the poor and for the foreigners. So the, God, God thinks about everything for your male and for your female slaves and for your hired worker. And at the end of the seven year, you have to grant a release because says God. So the debts are being canceled. So again, in the economics of the poor, uh, they are really, really being, being helped. And I want to go to... Um, uh, the, the slide about uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15. Maybe you skip, I think it's the next slide whatsoever. Yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1 to 15, but I only highlight a few scriptures. I will give you the context from verse 1. At the end of the seventh year, you shall grant a release. Okay? And then in verse 4, it says, there will be no poor. This is God's society. There will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you and the land that he gives to you. So in God's economy, there's no poor, because there's a system to protect. Every seven years, the debts are being canceled, because uh, there would be uh, something happening like this. People prosper, some people lose, or, you know, something bad happened to them. And some people were, had to kind of give away their land to get some money to survive, or give their children, or even give themselves, like a slave or, uh, you know. So after seven years, this goes back to you. And then there was a righteous system. Let's see, this is based on seven years. So you would sell yourself at the beginning of the seven years, or at three years in the seven years, or the last year of the seven years. There were different value system that was fair. So God had an economy for all of this. But what I want to draw your attention to, there will be no poor among you. And verse 5 says, if you only will strictly obey the voice of the Lord. If you follow the rule of the Lord, there will be no poor. There will be justice uh, in the land. If you go to verse 9, I want to make a point on verse 9. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart. And you say, and here the unworthy thought, and your heart is, uh, uh, there should, there, there's a word missing about heart, it's like wicked. There's really a word there, wicked. Um, it's like uh, Belial. That's the word Belial before the heart. A heart of Belial, uh, without profit, worthless, wickedness, evil, ungodly, wicked. So there's really something. So be careful, because the, the thing is that when it's time to restore the land, when it's time to practice God's law, okay, you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his needs, whatever it may be. Take care, lest there be an unworthy or like a bad thought that would crawl into your mind and your wicked heart. And you will see the seventh year is the year of release is near. In other words, there's not a lot of money to make if I'm going to lend money on the sixth year. It's like the seven year, I cannot make money, it's not worth it, so I ignore him. But the poor needs food today, he, he needs help right now. So it's, it's easy to ignore them, because there's not enough profit to make. So be careful, if you, if you think in this way and you let any unworthy thought of that kind come in your wicked heart, and you say to yourself, the seventh year of the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, you despise him, and you give him nothing, and he cried to the Lord against you, you will be guilty of sin. That, and this is, this is something for all. For us here, prejudice, looking at people with different value system, despising someone because he's not of the same uh, social status, doesn't have the same, you know, doesn't navigate in the same circle of friends, doesn't have the same uh, 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 position in society than we have. You know, we are quite fami fam 
familiar, most of us, with the middle class. We, we navigate quite well. We are kind of more or less on the same level, money-wise and, you know, education-wise and spending habits, conversation, mentality, education, and we, we navigate well. But we are not so keen to navigate with people who are so different from us from cultural background, educational background, or, or uh, financial ab ability background. It's not the same. And we normally would not see ourselves like a racist or having prejudices. It's like we don't recognize it when, when we have it, but w we do have these kind of things. And here it says, be careful to have these kind of weird thinking that does not think like God and you let your, your eyes as a garage or different uh, systems to, to judge and evaluate people, and then you have wicked heart, and then you, there's not enough profit to make. I would not gain enough of the relationship with someone. I don't have time to waste with this person, or it's not worth to do something like that. And all of us, I think we are guilty of sin and this uh, at some point in, in our lives. And we need to think about it because we, the, the title of the message is, Lord, help me to get the right perspectives in terms of money, wealth, but it goes way beyond money itself. It's money because money is society. Money is a value to trade. M uh, money is a value that sets me up in the society at a certain level. Because of money or how I am perceived to have money, people trust me. I go to the bank, I ask for a loan, they trust me because I'm supposed to have be able to pay back. So money as a, a system like this, so we may look grudgingly to one and look to another one, but in God's economy, it's not like that. In verse 10, you shall give him freely and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him because it is the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all you undertake. Again, the wonderful promise, you want to walk with the Lord, you want to have the full blessing and the covering of the Lord, you want your life to go well with peace and you know satisfaction and everything, and he it's, it's, it's said it so well here, give him freely and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him, because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all you undertake. And a little bit further, is there another verse that comes after that? Yes, verse 13 and 14. After the six years that this person has sold themselves to you and you're supposed to release on the seventh year, and when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, threshing floor, wine press. That's the rule of giving. As the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. And I think this opened a lot of new way to look at how we give, how we support the poor, how we, you know, we, we take responsibilities. God has blessed me. So how should I bless others? That's basically what it does. Remember when I came to Hong Kong with my four children, we were on a very tight, tight, tight budget. Many times at the end of the month, there was not money. I was always uh, waiting for the, the check to come from our church. Because our church back home, I had not promised, I had not been sent by an organization. I came here in pure obedience to the word of God. So the, but my church says, we will give a monthly offering for your family. Whatever is given is whatever you get. So when it's more, you get more. If it's less, you get less, that's it. And sometimes we get less. So that, that's how we came to Hong Kong and we live. And when our missionary friends would go to the restaurant on Sunday, we never went to the restaurants for a long, long time. We would go to, to, our, to our home. We would have a crock pot and a piece of meat, put it there, and then we would go home and eat whatever we had. For many years, here we live on an extremely tight budget. Our children were young and all this, and God has blessed us for many things. Today, I'm not rich, 
You know, when I started to work at Lighthouse, Pastor Jennifer and I, we didn't have salaries. For a long time, for years, we didn't have salaries. The, the church would give uh, what they call an allowance for travel, uh, food, if we go to the restaurant and meet someone. That says, for many, many years, we did not receive salaries, but we were uh, hired. We received some money, but we didn't receive uh, salaries. But later on, it has improved. This has improved. Uh, and then our children left one by one to go. So today, I'm not still rich, but I have a, f a financial freedom that I did not have before. And I feel a, a responsibility, you know, I have made myself a rule, and yeah, this is not your business, this is my business, but I wanted to share you. Okay, if I buy a mobile phone, okay, because you know I like electronics and stuff like that, <laughs> I'm, I'm Mr. Gadget, so if I buy a mobile phone, I tell myself, okay, I, I bless myself with that, I must give the same amount in my offering to the Lord. Not my tithe, the tithe is separate. But I will pay some, the same amount in uh, offering to the Philippines, to something, or here in Hong Kong, whatever. I need to reinvest that. Because that money I, bl I enjoy for myself, you know, I, I waste it on me. So I, I must, uh, this is a, some, some personal rule that I have done because I believe this principle here. As the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to Him. You know, when I came to Hong Kong, uh, I did not know a lot of things. Oh, I passed my time. <gasps> oh, I had to stop. Okay, stop. <laughs> Let's stand. I'm sorry. <laughs> i tell you that story another time. Come to the second, the second service if you want. <laughs> Let us stand. I don't want.